Death Claims, A Day Branstetter Mystery, Book 2, Author, Joseph Hansen, Publisher, University of Wisconsin Press, Terrace Books, Narrator, Eric Ost. Chapter 4. The ranch had a small valley to itself in a rock-strewn hills five miles back from the coast highway. The herd was token, maybe twenty head, breeding stock, broad-backed, slab-sided, short-legged, rust and white. They browsed on grass that looked too green to be real. Horses moved in a rail fence paddock, half a dozen palominos, coats glossy in the winter sun. Beyond them, a framework of overhead sprinkler pipe, glass beaded, the shiny leafage of an orange grove, stable, outbuildings. The ranch house itself looked like a movie set, plain bat and board-sided, low-roofed, sheltered by old oaks, red geraniums, and window boxes. The yard was flagged and cars stood there, a wide new Chrysler station wagon, a black Lincoln limousine that looked as if it got a lot of polishing, but was filmed with country dust now, and a yellow lotus, looking like what it was, a lethal toy. When he left his own car, a red setter got up lank off the green painted boards of the long one-step-up gallery of the ranch house and stood looking at him, a bitch with pups somewhere. He walked to her, spoke, bent, and held out the back of his hand to her. She touched it with a cold nose and her tail swung amiably. He scratched her ears, a string of varnished gourds, peppers, swashes, hung gaudy next to the front door. Below it was a bell push. He thumped it and inside chimes played. Four notes of a tune he hadn't heard since World War II. A gospel tune. Love lifted me. He remembered a bleak barracks and the lonesome wheeze of a dollar harmonica. Then suddenly everybody singing, everybody but him. He hadn't known the words, but he'd learned them. There was no way not to. Also, obscene variations, he grinned to himself. And a bony, freckled girl in a starchy green shirt maker dress opened the door. No makeup, frizzy red hair yanked back and knotted, pencil stuck in the knot, horn-rimmed glasses in a 40s movie. She'd have turned out lovely in the last reel. Yes, she said crisply. May I help you? I'd like to see Mr. Wade Cochran. Her smile was weary. So would several million other people. How did you find this place? It took some telephoning, about an hour's worth, by me and a team of secretaries in my office. Screen Actors Guild, American Federation of Television, and Radio Artist. Two agents, a business manager, a television studio, a recording studio, three police departments, sheriff's offices in two counties, the State Highway Patrol, the Bureau of Records in Sacramento, the U.S. Department of Agriculture, the Cattle Breeders Association, and I'm sure I've left out a few. I think I deserve to be rewarded for sheer persistence. She wasn't amused. Have you a card? He gave her a card, and she read it and said, but you telephoned. I told you he couldn't see you. Your error, Dave said. You should have told me he was out. Mr. Cochran doesn't permit us to lie. She half shut the door, then opened it again, said, Will you wait, please, and closed it tight. He crouched beside the setter, whose muzzle lay between her long front paws on the green boards. He scratched her ears again, and she shut her eyes and rumbled contentedly. His look strayed to the empty hills. Not empty. A lone horseman rode the bridge at a walk. High above him, a red-tailed hawk drifted on a lazy wind, sun haloing its wings. Behind Dave, the door opened, and the red-haired girl's voice said, "'Come in, please.' The set decorator had been here. The room was 1880, pinks and bachelor buttons in the wallpaper, furniture machine, carved walnut and oak, glowingly refinished, upholstered in tufted black leather, coal oil lamps on marble top tables with red ball fringe, throws the girl led him across the floor of gleaming pine planks and braided oval rugs. Briskly, 
So he only glimpsed by the filled stone fireplace at the room's end, a white-haired woman in dark glasses seated in a wheelchair, gaunt, big-boned, leathery, Mrs. Pioneer, a man with a mane of straw-colored hair and a face like a nine, a new plow blade, bent toward her from a platform rocker, talking. Mr. Evangelist, the red-haired girl opened double doors with narrow panels of fern-leaf patterned frosted glass, and it was the last half of the 20th century again. A big swimming pool glittered blue in a flagged patio walled in by eels of the house. A swimmer angled toward the bottom of the pool. Dave's heart jarred. A man lay down there on his face, a clothed man, inert, limbs stirred by the motion of the water. The swimmer reached him, slid an arm under his chin, pushed backward and up, kicking for the surface. Following the bubbles of his spent breath, he broke the surface, gulped air, shook back blonde hair, and still gripping the throat of the limp man in the crook of a muscular arm, half turned and with his free hand stroked for the pool edge. When he reached it, he grimaced, struggling to lift the unconscious weight. Dave ran to help him, crouched, gripped the body under the soggy arms, and heaved upward. He staggered backward and nearly fell, because it wasn't heavy. It had almost no weight at all. For seconds, he stood there, stupidly clutching it, while his sweatness soaked into his clothes. It wore a plaid flannel shirt and Levi's and cowboy boots, but it wasn't a man. It was a dummy. He heard a chuckle. The swimmer grinned at him. In two easy motions, he was out of the pool. Thanks, he said, but he's as near resuscitated as he's ever going to get. You don't need to bother with him anymore. Just let him down easy. He picked up a towel from a redwood chase and dried his hair. What's the idea? Dave asked. Next script, I film. There was a terry cloth robe on the chase. He flapped into it. I got to rescue the boy in the story from drowning in a river. He nodded the sash. It won't be easy as this, but I'm trying to keep the current and all that in mind. His grin made handsome gouges in his face. That's where the acting comes in, like the struggling you did just now to wrestle him out of the pool. Like that, they'll have to weight him more in the river. But he'll never be more than 50, 60 pounds, I expect. The accent was modified southwest. Nothing else was modified. He stood six feet four and perfect. There were probably more beautiful men alive. Dave hadn't seen them. The actor stuck out a hand. I'm Wade Cochran. You're Branstetter. Katie tells me you went to a lot of trouble to track me down. What can I do for you? I'm looking for someone. A boy. His father drowned last week. He was insured by my company. The boy is the beneficiary. His name is Peter Oates? Cochran looked blank. I don't know him. He was seen in your car late one night at the theater, the old mill up the canyon back of El Molino. Remember? He had the lead in a play called Lorazanco. You were in the audience every night. Ah! Cochran slapped his forehead. That kid, of course. Sure. He looked past Dave, who turned the red-haired girl still stood at the end of the pool beside a black cluster of videotape equipment. Cochran called to her. Katie, will you bring us out some of that cranberry juice? She walked briskly and prim along the far edge of the pool and vanished into a breezeway. A door closed. Cochran said, I drove him back to the theater one night. We'd been to a seafood place down in town there, Las Gaviatas. He'd been begging to talk to me. Cochran sat on the chase. A redwood table was next to it, where an open shooting script lay. Then there was a chair. He tilted his head at it. Dave sat. People pester you, but he had talent, and I'd like to be fair. The far door closed again, and he turned to watch, Katie bringing a fat glass jug of red liquid in tumblers with ice cubes on a tray of Mexican hammer tin. She set it on the table. Will you be going to the lodge tonight? I was. Who wants to know? Your mother. Katie unscrewed the cap on the jug and filled the glasses. She'd like the reverend to stay over. He will if you're going to be here. All right, Cochran said. 
I won't go till after supper, and I'll be back to have breakfast with him. You can tell her. Katie twisted the cap. Back on the jug. She'd rather you stayed over. She's told the network people they want to get footage of you here to together tonight. Cochran's mouth tightened. He wasn't happy, but he said, Okay, if it's all right with the Reverend. Katie smiled. Oh, she's already arranged it with him. Thank you. She'll be so pleased. She went away. While we were eating, Cochran said to Dave, The kid missed his watch. He was afraid to leave it up there, afraid somebody take it. Rip it off is the way he put it. He didn't have a car. It's too far to walk. I drove him back. After the play closed, he stayed away from the theater. Dave said, Whittington, the man who runs it, has the impression you made him some kind of offer? Cochran shook his head and gulped from his glass. You couldn't cast him in the stuff we shoot. He's too slight. Speech is too good. I don't expect to find anybody at that place. Not for westerns. He nodded at Dave's glass. Try that. It's good stuff. Healthy. They say you drink enough cranberry juice, you'll never get cancer. Dave tasted it and wondered how much would be enough. Very good, he said. Thanks. Why did you keep going back? Why did you stop after Peter Oates stopped? Why did he leave home about that time and not tell anyone? Anyone living? Where he was going? Cochran shrugged. You're asking the wrong man, Dave gave him a cold smile. Not about why you kept going back to the play. I'm planning a feature on the life of St. Paul. People said Whittington's a genius, you know. He was very big on Broadway. But when they started doing nothing but junk on Broadway, he left. He made a couple of films. Quiet for this. Quit for the same reason. He's got integrity. I don't want some Hollywood hack. Those people are all corrupt. The director I hire's got to have brains and taste and reverence. Dave said. My team and I will supply that. Cochran swallowed more juice. Anyway, I heard about Whittington, and I went to size him up for myself. He was as good as they say, but I wasn't about to make a snap decision. This will take a couple million dollars, this picture, most of it, my own. I'm walking around it a lot. Did you ask him? Will he do it? I asked him, Cochran said. He won't. He doesn't like the mass media, Dave said. Cochran nodded rather starve in that backwater doing what he wants, what he thinks is important. Man can't help but admire that. He looks as if he gets enough to eat, Dave said. He's draining all his savings into that place, Cochran said. My manager made inquiries. The city cut his budget this year. It wasn't but a few thousand to start with. Now it's nickels and dimes. He breathed a short laugh. Know why he sent you here? Nuisance value. I gave him a check, and he didn't like that. Oh, he kept it, but he hated me for being able to give it. Dave said, And you don't know what happened to Peter Rhodes. Kids take things hard. Maybe after I turned him down, he decided acting was no use. Maybe he was ashamed of failing, and that's why he ran off. Didn't want to hear I told you so from his folks. Lots of parents discourage their kids from acting. I thank the blessed Lord every day for giving me the mother he did. Again, Cochran looked past Dave. Again, Dave turned the double doors with the frond pattern stood wide. The white-haired woman sat there in her wheelchair, the evangelist standing behind her. Can't you quit and get in here now? The way she turned her face toward where he wasn't told, David, she was blind. But she had a voice to holler up upfield hands against a prairie wind. The reverend will think I never taught you manners. Be right there. Cochran got up from the chase. Sorry, I can't help. I expect when he gets over his bruises, he'll turn up. You hang on to that money for him. Dave rose. It may not be payable. Cochran blinked. What's that mean? Dave told him what it meant. No, Cochran scowled. No, you don't know him. He couldn't. Why, he's as gentle as... With twenty thousand dollars, Dave said. He might not need a lot of help with his career. He held at his hand and Cochran shook it. Reflexively, still scowling, troubled. Dave told him, Your girl Katie has my telephone number. 
Let me know if he should happen to get in touch with you. Sure, Cochran was unsmiling, but he won't. Dave scratched the setter's ears again on the porch. A horseman rode in at the yard gate. The same rider he'd seen on the ridge. Slight, dark, but when he neared, he turned out to be forty. The skin on his bony face brown increased as old harness. Not Peter Oates. A Gay Mysteries Audiobooks I think it is easy to hate a label, but a face humanizes the word. So this effort is twofold, to offer comfort to those like myself that your world didn't end because you don't fit into the view of acceptable society on both sides, and in hopes of helping those with family that are LGBTQ, that it doesn't mean we are aliens from the child they once knew, reassure them so they can maybe be supportive at the same time being true to their values.